Welcome to tonight's SOAS Center of Taiwan Studies uh, seminar. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome back uh, Professor Guan Dawei uh, Daya, who's um, teaching at uh, National Zhengzhou University, our favorite uh, university in, uh, in, uh, in, in Taiwan, um, uh, where he teaches in the uh, ethnology uh, department. Um, and he's here for his second talk. He, he wowed us um, with his uh, lecture on, on Wednesday. Um, and one of the things about his Wednesday talk was there were a lot of questions that we wanted to ask, but he said, um, come back on Friday and I'll answer uh, those questions. So um, I'm glad to see quite a few um, people are coming back to ask those, uh, those questions. Um, one of the things we discovered in his talk on Wednesday was this, uh, the historical context to many of these uh, issues of land justice and land disputes in uh, facing Taiwan's indigenous uh, peoples. And he's going to go into a little bit more detail on that uh, topic uh, today. The other thing I should mention, uh, for those of you that are new to this, this series, is this is part of our uh, Contemporary Taiwan Indigenous Peoples uh, lecture series. Uh, last academic year we, we did, I think, 20 events on, on this series, so focusing um, on issues related or affecting Taiwan's um, Indigenous Peoples to, uh, in today's society. Um, and this project is a two-year project but sponsored by um, uh, the Shunyi Museum uh, in, uh, in, in Taipei. I'm going to stop there because we're a little bit um, late, but um, let's um, welcome uh, Daya uh, one more time. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, it's me again. And uh, today I would like to begin with uh, answering the question Vivi proposed uh, in my last talk <laughs> uh, Wednesday. Uh, I remember that uh, Vivi asked, uh, we want to delineate traditional territory of indigenous people, then what year you want to expect, right? Mm -hmm. How do you decide, uh, decide the line, the boundary, which is the correct one, right? Uh, and I answer to be that uh, it is a political issue rather than an epidemic issue. So it really needs negotiation uh, between indigenous people and the government and also between indigenous people and the descendants of settlers. I kind of um, reserve part of my answer uh, for the talk today. Um, yes, it, it requires negotiation, but What's the basis for, for our negotiation? Is that uh, some historical evidence for us to find an uh, exact uh, boundary? Um, I don't think so. I think what uh, the basis for our negotiation is an uh, alternative way of living. We are not uh, doing uh, boundary delineation um, for drawing picture or, or drawing the map. We are doing this is, is to find a space or a place for us to practice our culture, right? So uh, if we, we were just um, proposing some, some, some political uh, design or ideological legal framework without understanding our own culture, then that would be something empathy. So that's why I, last time I mentioned that my first talk it's about dialoguing with uh, the state and also propose a better institutional solution. Uh, but we need to do that with the basis of our understanding of our uh, culture of land. And that is exactly the subject I'm going to talk about today. So that's m uh, my outline. And uh, I'm going to start here. Um, if you look at the map, then you can see a lot of dots on the map. The dot uh, refers to the uh, reservoir in Taiwan. So uh, the, uh, you know that in, the, in Taiwan, the central part is the mountain. It's also where indigenous people live in, right? That's our, uh, mostly our traditional territory. So, and uh, since the mountain uh, is the watershed for the uh, reservoir, it's very important uh, uh, source supplying water to the reservoirs. 
So this uh, region is uh, sensitive and also uh, important, right? Ecologically sensitive and also important. So that uh, made indigenous people inevitably involved in a lot of ecological politics in Taiwan. When I say ecological politics, this means uh, the political process to make decision of what is the resources and how do you utilize or exploit it, the resources <coughs> and what's the method you're, you, 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 you're going to utilize it and who is included to benefit from the resources and who is sacrificed during the process. In the process you are, you are exploiting or utilizing the resources. So uh, this is uh, my f the main field site of my research. And you can see uh, there's a reservoir called Shiman Shui Ku, Shiman Reservoir, that supplied water to most of the North Taiwan plain area, like uh, Xinzhu, Taoyuan. Uh, before, it also supplied water to Taipei, but later Taipei has uh, Fei Cui Shui Ku, Fei Cui Reservoir. But it's still important now uh, because it's st still supplying water to Xinzhu and Taoyuan. And um, upstream, that's where my people live in uh, the mountain area, the Xinzhu, uh, Tao, uh, uh, the Jianshi Xiang and Fu Xinxiang, uh, the indigenous uh, township in the north part of the mountain of Taiwan. Uh, so there are reservoirs. Uh, there is a reservoir, and uh, there are a lot of um, land use regulation that is uh, that are implemented by the government, because the, the soil water needs to be protected so that clean water can be safe and sent to the uh, downstream to the reservoir. So there are various uh, law or regulation that are, are implemented by the government, but all these regulation. There's no FPIC, no consideration of indigenous people's culture of land use, and no consideration of indigenous people's need for, for, for development. And very often we will get penalty because we violate one of the, or, or many of the, the, the regulations. Um, and these are two sets of uh, pictures. So, uh, the first set of picture, the upper one, it shows kind of perspective to look at the river. It look at the river from distance, right? So if you look at the river from distance, it's just a line in the valley. Um, and and you, you get very uh, structural uh, data from uh, the survey. You got the picture, the whole picture of the, this region uh, from the bird view. But if you don't look, but if you walk into the place, if you walk into the mountain, then you find you will find that river is not just a line. It's a place for people. It's a, a playground for the children. It also provides a lot of important resources to the people here. So if you just look from a bird view, or if you just look from distance, then you miss a lot of things here. Um, you might have a very structural. Uh, understanding in the uh, uh, overall picture, but you don't know the, the, the emotion or the value or the struggle of people in this, in this region. And this is a very typical uh, way that uh, modern construction do for watershed management. Uh, it's a, a, a um, com comparison before and after the government built a check dam. Uh, in, in, in the river. Actually, there are more than 100 check dams like this. The check, check dams were built to uh, keep the soil and, and rock get into the mainstream, right? So for the engineer, it's, a function, it's functioning very well to uh, keep clean water uh, to, to move into the, 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 the reservoir, or it make the a river carry clean water to the reservoir. But you know that with a check dam like this, it's kind of ruin the play playground and ruin a lot of imp important ecology. So, like what you can see from these pictures, 
uh, after the construction, the ditch, the, the, the river or the creek turn into a ditch, right? Mm -hmm. it, it can supply water, it carry water to the reservoir, of course, but there, there, there will be no fish, no shrimp. It's no more ecological system. It's just a ditch. So, uh, I began my PhD study here, where it's also uh, actually my hometown. And the question I propose is, what is the environmental discourse from Dayan, my people's perspective, right? You, you see an engineering perspective, but what is my, uh, the perspective from my people? So I adopt uh, the research method, including ethnographical study, uh, participatory observation, in-depth interview, and community mapping that I'm going to focus on today. So you see people barbecue here, right, in this picture. And I actually organized a lot of barbecue <laughs> party during my research because, you know, um, my people love meat a lot and we love share, share, share food a lot. And by eating, it's kind of connect, connect people. So, uh, there, uh, and I luckily got some sp uh, sponsorship. So I have m a budget to buy uh, meat and organize a lot of barbecue party in the, uh, in the village. I ask people when we eat, uh, what's your experience with the river? What's the most impressive memory you have with, uh, with in, uh, in the river? Then I record uh, the spatial data with map. I even uh, took the community elder to a public hearing of the reservoir uh, management. That's the very first time that uh, uh, we have indigenous uh, elders to, to, to go to the hear public hearing. So there, there were actually a lot of stories. I saw people, I saw families uh, I, uh, went to the river uh, during the vacation. Uh, there were families, so they went there together. And by you know, having fun in the river, they, their relation was strengthened. Uh, and uh, I saw these uh, adults, they show me their fish and spear or fish and cage happily. Um, the lady uh, on the top, on the first uh, photo on the right hand side, uh, I, I did an, uh, a lot of interview with her and I, I remember one time I asked her, uh, what's the most impressive memory you have uh, in the river? And she told me that was with my husband. Uh, her husband already died, but his, uh, she said that uh, when, when, when we were still young, uh, in summer, summer night, she, he will took me to, to the river. So he went uh, dive into the river, spear, spear fish, and we got fish, then we cook the fish. We cook fish soup beside the river. Only we too, so we share the, the, the fish soup. <coughs> And the, the, the test of fish soup, she say, is the most sweet thing I have ever had. And I watch it, when I watch in her face, her smile, I know the sweetness is not just about the fish or the soup. It's about the relation with her husband, the memory in the river. Um, the, 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 the elder on the second, uh, in the second photo I, I was interviewing, he is the most famous uh, spear fishing, uh, uh, fishing spear maker in that region. And he told me that the very first toy he had, he had is a, was a gift his father gave him. And he was just four years old. Uh, uh, it was his birthday, so his father gave him a spear fish, uh, uh, I'm sorry, fish spear uh, as a uh, present. He, he was so happy, and his father quickly took him to the uh, river. They walked through the path and to, uh, to the river um, to, to go spear fishing. And he, he just followed his father, but, but he, he was so excited, so he kept playing the uh, uh, fishing spear. So he shoot the spear uh, in accident to his father's spot. Oh. So he told me that my very first prey was my father's spot. <laughs> so and uh, the the so tell elder. What the father said. Uh, what was the father's reaction? <laughs> That's another story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the elder uh, in the third picture, he told me that he witnessed 
the collective uh, group vision uh, in the river section that uh, go through the boundary between two groups. And that's a very big event. Uh, he was just a teenager then. And he also told me that uh, the most tasty uh, fish in the river was the river eel. And he said, uh, it, will be very, it will be wonderful if we can test that again. But it is impossible because there are a lot of check them now. An eel will go to the ocean, uh, lay sperm, and come back to the to 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 the upstream, right? Since the check dam was built, the uh, the eel will eel will not come back again. So here you see that um, for the engine engineer, river might be something carrying the water, but for people here. River is more than that. It's carrying the memory of people and carrying the social relations of people, carrying their life story. So uh, I would like to uh, give a little more background of the uh, indigenous community mapping in Taiwan. And we mentioned in that talk that there was a new partnership treaty, firstly signed during the period uh, uh, Chen Shui-bian was running for uh, the campaign for, for his uh, president office. And then uh, in 2002, when he was the president, he confirmed and hosted a ceremony uh, to confirm the new partnership treaty. And within the treaty, there is one article saying that uh, the, go the government should recover the traditional territory of indigenous people's community and, uh, of, uh, of indigenous community and peoples. That's why we, we, we have uh, the discussion of um, the returning of traditional territory in this talk, right? Uh, and right, ap uh, right uh, after the announcement or the, the confirmation of the new partnership treaty, uh, the Con Council of Indigenous People launched a series of mapping projects. It's kind of response uh, to, to, to the, the, the treaty. It's, uh, it's kind of uh, action to fulfill the political promise. And I, I, I am very lucky that uh, the, I participate in the very first stage of the uh, mapping work uh, uh, that began in 2002. Of course, before 2002, there were also uh, some individual research that was conducted by scholars or community workers. But that's very, you know, uh, limited. But uh, since uh, 2002, the Council of Indigenous People launched a nationwide survey. So uh, all the community or all the indigenous township were involved in, in the uh, mapping project. They, they, they invited um, the geography department in the community. They have the uh, local government officer involved in, and, and, and then we do uh, the uh, ground survey, we do the uh, public hearing, we do the uh, mental mapping, we also uh, have community, community people to involve in the mapping uh, process. So basically, uh, that's the very beginning that the idea of indigenous community mapping, or they say participatory mapping, were uh, um, con uh, introduced to Taiwan and practiced in Taiwan. And then uh, from 2002 to 2012, in the 10-year period, it, um, the government invests uh, a lot of resources in the, the, a different series of mapping projects. So from 2002 to 2006, it's a mapping uh, that uh, take settlement as basic unit. But from 2007 to 2009, ethnic group turned into the basic unit for mapping. Um, and then 2009 to 2012, the government had the exhibition and, uh, to show the, the outcome of the mapping. And also uh, with the suggestion from the um, academic uh, worker, the uh, the government hosts the work, work workshop 
actually the government provides sponsor sponsorship so that uh, the, the scholars, include me and my colleague, can host uh, a lot of workshop in different regions so that we can empower the community to have more capacity to do uh, their uh, mapping work. So gradually we see the, 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 the results. There are more and more self-organized surveys of community uh, mapping and their diverse outcome. Uh, the, or, or they say that the outcome uh, are more diverse than what we had in the previous stage. Because in the previous stage, stage that's one of uh, examples show the outcome of the survey organized by the government. We, 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 we uh, record the place name, uh, try to find the uh, boundary and uh, the uh, area, the region of traditional territory for each individual settlement. That's how I say it's a settlement best uh, survey. But later uh, in the uh, project from 2007 to 2009, uh, we have to find the uh, traditional territory for each uh, ethnic group. Under the, 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 in the project that is um, led by the government uh, from 2000 to 2012, the government, because it's a nationwide survey, so the government require a unified outcome, right? The process is, you know, uh, try to, to, to be unified. Uh, the, the government tried to make the process unified and make the outcome unified so the uh, administration can collect all the information very quickly and smoothly. But after 2012, we see uh, there are more and, uh, and more diverse outcome. Uh, more than just collecting the place name or the line or point or, or, or area, uh, we, we see uh, uh, there, there, there is a deepening uh, discourse and interpretation of indigenous land knowledge more than just uh, a point or line or area. Uh, and there's actually some tensions between the government, the community, and the uh, academy. For example, uh, the government will has its own logic for, of administration, like uh, since it's a, a action to fulfill the political promise. So the government is, uh, the government kept requiring the uh, academy to have uh, exact or concrete uh, area of traditional territory of each settlement. So if you want to calculate the outcome, right, the, uh, of how many hectares you have surveyed or you got, or you have identified after the survey, then that will become some. Um, um, result shows uh, that the government has fulfilled its political promise, right? Uh, but the, uh, the the political, I mean, the academic research researchers, including me, found it's very difficult to just draw the boundary between each settlement. Sometimes there was there is no boundary between settlements, and but if you don't have enough um, area that uh, come out from the survey, then, then you are facing the pressure uh, from the payment of uh, uh, li li liquidate uh, damage, which means there are some uh, requirement in the contract signed between the government and the. the, the researchers, right? So there, there's a tension. Sometimes we can persuade uh, the, or convince the government. Sometimes the government will kind of threaten you. you. You need to have the outcome, otherwise you're violating our country. Mm -hmm. So we always, you know, go back and forth. And there are also some tension between the, the, the academic and the community. Like, uh, we, we are always, you know, question ourselves or being questioned. Are you making a right uh, in, uh, interpretation? Uh, and it's a kind of chain reaction. Like uh, for the issue of accessibility of the tool, if you have um, 
like a more high-tech um, uh, a mapping a tool, it's more the outcome will be more accessible for the government, right? If you just draw with rock or or pencil or or tree branch on the on the sand, it's doable, right? Mm -hmm. For a, a sketch map, but for the government, that's something in sense. So if you have a GIS and beautiful map, then the government will say, oh, that's that's it. But that will make a more barrier. Uh, for the barrier higher, um, make the barrier higher for the county member to assess to, to the tool, right? So there are always some tension between this. And when the uh, academic researchers hold, hold the knowledge of different kind of mapping tool, the community also has their knowledge, the language, the knowledge behind the language, that which is important. I think that's the core uh, for the mapping, right? So you need to find some uh, mechanism for be a mutual benefit, get the trust between the academy and the community so that they, they will be willing to share the knowledge with you. And it, it also requires you to be responsible when you get this uh, 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 knowledge, right? You are trained to be responsible for the, the community. So there are always tension like this. Also, there are tension between the government and community. When the government is the uh, a provider of resources, uh, um, you are kind of, uh, from the good side, the, the community get the resources from the government to do the work. But from the bad side, it's very easy for the government to take back the, 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 the outcome of mapping. And it sometimes will kind of, uh, uh, appropriate the outcome, and, and for example, the, the definition of traditional territory we, we, we mentioned uh, in our last talk is kind of appropriation, right? And this is one of the example that um, in Sumangus, uh, the, the case we mentioned in our talk, I, I mentioned that uh, because of the map, the traditional territory mapping, the court, the judge, accept that, uh, agreed that um, it, it is Smangu's community's traditional territory and, and Smangu's community do have the right to collect the wood from it, right? But it, it, there are more subtle story, more, in, in more detail. In the very beginning, in the survey, which is conducted in uh, 2002, uh, you can see the, the boundary, the, the mapping team draw on the map the green one. Uh, but actually, the location of windfallen big tree is outside the boundary. So that comes to the very, um, you know, uh, question of questionable. And the, the judge asked, since the, 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 the location is outside the boundary uh, of the uh, survey, that how, how can you say that Smangu's community is traditional territory. But it's actually, in Dayan uh, customary law, Smangu's people do have the right to collect wood from there. It is because, uh, from, from our, uh, our knowledge, the hunting field is never belonged to one single settlement. So you see the, the red dot that represents uh, the settlement belong to uh, the same settlement group. So, because the, the survey was, in the, in the very beginning, was only conducted in Smangu's community, so they only draw the boundary of Smangu's community. But actually, all, uh, there are wider boundary for all these different, or they say, wild, wilder hunting field for all these uh, different uh, settlements. And put them together, that's all the settlements belong, belong to Mariguan uh, settlement group. And being, a, being part of the Maragon settlement group, Smangus do actually do have the right to collect wood uh, from that location. So later the government tried to uh, announce a territory of Maragon uh, settlement group, which is the purple, purple line. But when the government uh, make, uh, host a public hearing in the township government, 
that cause another debate uh, uh, in, in, the com in the community because the, the, the community member from the settlement uh, in the Green Dot came to the public hearing and he yelled at the government officer and pointed to the community elder from Smamus. He said, this morning, when I, before I came to this uh, public hearing, my father told me it was your grandfather taught him how to hunt in, in, in your hunting field. If you say that's the, 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 the hunting field of Smangus or of Malaguan people only, why we, Ganazi people, uh, my, my father learned his hunting skill in your hunting field from your, 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 your father? So gradually we, 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 we learned that because they, were, they, they are relative and in Diane's people's customary, customary law, even those we belong to different settlement group, once uh, we become relative for, uh, through ma marriage, then I can take you to my hunting field. As long as you come with me uh, under my lead, you can go hunt with me in, in this hunting field of my settlement group. So from this case, you can see that in, in, in the Diane uh, logic, the right over resources is not set up by the fixed geographical boundary. It's actually based on the relationship, the, 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 the social relations that, that is uh, fluid or, or, or changeable. So it's not fixed on the geographical boundary. It's 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 based on it's based on the social relations, flexible social relations. So after uh, my PhD study, I continue part of my research in the same research area to get try to get more understanding of indigenous knowledge of land use and. and and, and inter to make the interpretation of its ecological meaning. And I also try to facilitate the dialogue between indigenous knowledge and the modern science so that we can foster, foster some resource management regime that can have indigenous knowledge participate in. So these are some uh, cases of the uh, mapping workshop, workshop we conducted uh, in different years in-depth interviews to we collect the place name uh, in the uh, during the field work and that's the um, migration route that we uh, established uh, part of the, the bigger picture was already constructed or, or <coughs> narrated by one uh, Diane Elder but I did the, the minor part and this And, and what I want to say is uh, the, the knowledge of migration is not from a systematic uh, um, a book or a, a, some knowledge or, or already put into a systematic way. It's kind of scattered in different parts of the knowledge system or, or, or in, 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 in different um, way or, or different part of the culture. Chanting, for example, uh, uh, oral history. So this is the example that we collect um, the information of migration from the chanting called Manahu, uh, the Mahu in Dayan's culture. I'm not sure whether it will have voice. So that's the, the sound of the chanting, right? So it tells the story of how our ancestors moved from one spot to another spot, and how different branches are separate from each other and moved to different watersheds. So here, you can see that because we, uh, our ancestors moved from one watershed to another, uh, we, they walked through the mountain, uh, across the mountain ridge and go down to a new watershed, built a uh, the settlement there, uh, over and over. 
So uh, we can see, we can find a lot of knowledge of uh, the river, a lot of knowledge of the uh, mountain ridge. This is one of the example when we see uh, the, the, the knowledge of the landscape through naming the, the language. There are very, very uh, subtle uh, names of landform that refers to different uh, landform of the river landscape. Similarly, uh, in Dayan language, there are a lot of different vocabulary it refers to different subtle landforms uh, of the uh, mountain ridge landscape. And the human body and, 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 and landscape. Um, when we go to a new watershed, when, when our ancestors go to a, a new watershed and build settlement there, the very first settlement they will build is the settlement in the confluence of two rivers. And uh, that when the, the, the confluence of two rivers is called Habund in Dayan language. Uh, and in Dayan language, Habund also refers to the lower part of the chest. Okay, it's the, the shape, just like a belly. And uh, Babak, for example, it refers to the uh, certain shape of mountain, but that also refers to ear of human body. Mungu, uh, the tail, but it also refers to uh, the mountain ridge that extends to the, 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 the water uh, river valley. The knee or the elbow. Uh, Hagu refers to the elbow and also refers uh, the, to the, the shape of the river. So you see that uh, in, in our language, we un that shows that we understand the world by, you know, through the way we understand our body. Okay. So when you embody yourself in a river, you also embody your knowledge of the world, a different landscape. And uh, the resource management in landscape. Um, here in Dayan society, there are different uh, social categories. For example, Kutunikan means those who eat together. It's a minor uh, group in the settlement. Very often, it's organized by those who are uh, close, uh, close relatives. So people, uh, these people, they will go hunt together and share food together. And within uh, one settlement, in Dayan's language, it's called Gala. They might have uh, more than one uh, Kutunikan. So those people who belong to Kutunikan, they have to share a certain norm. And those who belong to one Gala, they have to share a certain norm in the Gala. And there are different settlements, different, more than one Gala uh, in, the, in the settlement group. And those who belong to the settlement group, they share the gyunan, which means the hunting field. And in the hunting field, they have to share certain norm. And even those you belong to different uh, settlement group, if you share the same river, you are categorized as kutulalil, which means those who share the same river. Then you also have to share certain norm. So you, you see that the, the, uh, the social category is embedded in the ecological system of river, of, of watershed. And uh, in my study, I also see that uh, the, the relations between the landscape and the knowledge of fishing. So uh, I collect the knowledge of fishing, and I found that it's not just about fish. It's about the river landscape. There are different river landscapes. And there are different fish in the river. They have their, their, their ha habits, right, habitants. And uh, you have adopt different methods to, 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 to get fish. Spearing fish or fishing with cage or, 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 or poisoning the fish with the root of dirt. There are diverse ways. And you, it, and you also have to negotiate with people, maybe with, uh, inside the settlement or, or within different settlements. 
because they have have, have to decide which river section and in what time they can go fishing together. Similarly, for for the knowledge of hunting is also highly con a rela a relevant to landscape. Like you have to have the knowledge of the landform, and then you you have to know that what kind of knowledge will prefer to appear in what kind of landscape, what kind of landform. Then you have to have different methods to get the prey. You also have to have the knowledge for social negotiation, like the rule for, for, for using the hunting cottage, the rule to avoid from invading other families' hunting route, or the rule to share the hunting field within the, water sh uh, the, the settlement group. For Sweden agriculture, similar to, uh, is connecting to the landscape, the knowledge of landscape. You need to have the knowledge of landform, the soil, the, the characteristic of the soil. You have to have the knowledge of crop and their, their habits. You have to have the method for cultivation to maintain the land. You also need to have knowledge to ne negotiate with, with people for exchanging the labor or exchanging the land. That's one of the examples that shows uh, in, in this in the, the, the knowledge of Sweden agriculture, that the young people will give name to one piece of land, to give different name to one piece of land in different periods. When the land is newly open, it will have a name. When it is partly used, another name. And when, when it is taken rest, another, another name. So that is kind of life, life cycle of land. And that's the pattern of cultivation when a, a, a land is used. You, you, you follow the subtle uh, landscape, so you cultivate different crop according to the, the change of the landscape. And uh, you will, for example, you leave uh, the, 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 the big tree trunk there, big rock there, you sometimes build a retaining wall with stone, uh, you grow uh, uh, something in the uh, 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 on the rock. So even though it's a very small piece of land, it's very the 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 biodiversity is very high high there because you grow different food inside to make sure you can have food in different seasons. So gradually, I, 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 I came to articulate uh, the, 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 the temporal uh, um, uh, system of land use in Dayan people's Sweden agriculture, which means uh, uh, there's a trans watershed migration that happens uh, every few generations. Then you have, uh, during a period, you are staying in one watershed. You shift. You practice Sweden agriculture, so you shift uh, from one uh, location to another. But when you are cultivating one piece of land, you, you probably uh, utilize it for three to from three to four years. Then you make it uh, take rest and come back ten years later. Okay. So within one year, uh, the uh, the smaller time scale. There are certain uh, uh, things you have to do and certain ceremony for that. And also the spatial articulation, articulation uh, of land use in Sweden agriculture. You see there is a, a larger scale between uh, watersheds. There, there is a smaller scale within the watershed of land use within the watershed and even smaller scale. That is uh, the cultivation over one individual land plot. And this kind of um, articulation is important because during the colonial era, when the colonial scientists came to Taiwan, they did their land survey, uh, forest survey, or river survey in indigenous, indigenous mountain quickly. And when they came back, they say, um, there are a lot of lands lie in this region, flood in this region. If you want to control the flood, then you have to control the forest. If you want to control the forest, then you have to prohibit 
indigenous people from practicing Sweden agriculture because they are do, they were doing the childish, uh, uncivilized way of agriculture, right? But now you know there are certain knowledge. It's not doing things unregulated. There are certain articulation in, and, and dynamic in, in this uh, Sweden agriculture. And also we know um, now that uh, this kind of rotation uh, of land use are even more ecological friendly than you just fix uh, the land use in one single piece of land, right? And this knowledge impo is important. It helps us to rethink what is more, what is a more proper way uh, for our resource management nowadays. These are some examples. Like uh, in, in, in my field site, there are uh, uh, farms uh, in this region. And according to the regulation that is um, implemented by the government, farm in this kind of steep slope is illegal. But actually, if you look, walk into the farm and you look closer, they were practicing uh, organic agriculture and they keep the tree and the grace uh, very uh, carefully, try to maintain uh, this, uh, their soil. And we also see that uh, some very subtle way to, to, to protect the water soil that is carried on uh, in the, uh, from the Sweden agricultural practice is still there. So my colleague and I did a, a, a minor project for a research to examine the so-called illegal farm land. Uh, because uh, according to the regulation, uh, the government will classify certain land as forest land and the other as farmland. Only the farmland, can, you can practice uh, agriculture there. And once the land is classified as forest land, you cannot practice agriculture. If you practice agriculture, then it's illegal farmland. So we did uh, the, the study to check those land who were defined, who, that those are defined as illegal farmland. Are they really, uh, eco, uh, I mean, uh, environmental uh, harmful? So we, 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 we did a, a study to check the uh, soil condition or land, landform condition in the last 10 years. And after the study, we see that one third of the so-called illegal farm land uh, under the government definition did not collapse in the last 10 years. Of course, we should further expand uh, our study to longer uh, time uh, period. But at least from here, we can start to think that the logic of the classification system, system for slope land uh, by the government is based on some fixed criteria like the degree of slope, the de depth of the soil, the condition of erosion. But from the Diane's perspective, from Diane land use knowledge, the, 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 the way you decide what is proper, proper uh, cultivation is, is very different. Um, it's based on how you take care of land the land and what kind of species or what kind of crop, crop you, 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 you were you know, growing. So we compare the different logic between the current, between current land use uh, classification system and Dayan land use knowledge. And further, we make suggestions to integrate indigenous knowledge into current manage, management regime, like changing the uh, minimum area for a classified land parcel changing the criteria for classification, and the judge-making process, decision-making process, needs to be you know, open to the uh, knowledgeable non community elder or uh, farm um, agricultural practitioner. This is another example that um, when the government tried to um, protect the watershed um, to keep the uh, water soil protection. Um,
they try to reinforce the regulations. So uh, many years ago, they hired local people to uh, report their neighbor or their neighboring uh, settlement community for their illegal land use. And from the perspective of the government, it's kind of participatory way because it's kind of involve local people. You hire local people to do the reporting work for you. So you let them participate uh, in the process. But that causes a lot of trouble uh, for the community when the neighbor is reporting each other, right? So, so I, I interviewed some of the people who were hired by the government. They say when they went to their uh, neighboring community, people let go the dog to chase them from their yard because they are not happy about that. Okay. But what I, I'm, I was, I'm thinking is these people, they do have their knowledge of their place, place or places. If you just ask them to uh, report their neighbor according to the government's regulation, you are have them participate in with their labor force. But how do you have their their knowledge participate in, in this process? So when I had the chance to when I was invited to to organize a workshop for this uh, it's it's common uh, in, in the elders to, to chant and uh, share the knowledge. It's also used to uh, that for as a tool for negotiating, mm -hmm. you know, proposing marriage. Ah. So so it's kind of art because uh, in in Dayan culture we don't want to say things very clear. Ah. So you use metaphor, ah, right? Okay. You use chanting. Mm -hmm. So elders chanting to each other, then 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 they come out to the agreement of the marriage or reconcile. Peace, uh, for peacemaking ah, okay. when they had to fight. So and was, was that the process for your marriage? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Because I married to different groups. Oh, okay. Right. But you point out a crisis. Not my marriage. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the language. Okay. Like, in, in my family, um, I, 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 I'm not able to speak Dayan language with my wife. Right? Because oh, okay. my wife comes from Bulun group. Ah, okay. So the way we communicate with each other is Mandarin. Okay. So we have very few chance to teach our children our language. Okay. Uh, or we will try to teach. But since we don't have constant conversation, mm -hmm. and we live in the urban area, so uh, we are trying, but still it's very difficult for them to mm -hmm. you know, take it as first language. And that's, I think that's kind of common crisis. So we have certain people who, devote, who are very devoted to learn this kind of art of language, like the chanting. Mm. But in general, still, yes, it's fading, I think. Mm. It's not as fast as, as like Sao people or other minor groups. So still, it's, there is a crisis. It, is that partly because of numbers? Is that a... a yeah, or, for, uh, for why dial language is slightly safer than there, I think that the environment is very important. Okay. No, no environment for you to speak the language. So if you go to the like to go back to the indigenous community, people do speak uh, the language, but for people living in the urban area, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. And according to the 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 uh, the, the statistic. Uh, survey, about one third to half of indigenous people is now living in the urban area. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are less chance for us to, to speak our language. Yeah. Okay, let's open up to some uh, questions. Okay, yeah, uh, for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I actually was mentioned in the talk, I'm very honoured. <laughs> um, I have two questions uh, yes, to start with. Um, first of all, uh, because I, I have done a little bit uh, um, uh, research on, on map, so I, I know in the 1980s that Taiwan has this uh, 
general lands survey and really uh, produce quite a lot of uh, complete um, mapping. The thing is, now you are, um, this 2000 to 2012 mm -hmm. project, how is it used? Why is it stopped just there? You know, what happened in the past few years? Mm -hmm. You know, um, is there any outcome of this kind of indigenous mapping being commonly used, mm -hmm. like the, those surveys done in the 80s? Mm -hmm. The second question is, um, you mentioned about the tensions between the government, the academic, and the communities. My question is, has this uh, tension been resolved? You know, has it get some sort of uh, between the government uh, and the community and the, and the uh, academics? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, for the first question, um, the outcome of the uh, mapping project from 2002 to 2012, um, it turned into a very uh, question by the government. Because their only point, line, and area, then uh, how do you use that point and line area on the map to say that's your traditional territory. Um, so what's the point of the 10 years of mapping? The re one of the reasons, I think, is when the government launched the mapping process, mm -hmm. the indigenous basketball hasn't been uh, enacted yet. So they, 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 there was no enough um, methodology thinking or consideration for what kind of outcome we should have and how can the outcome contribute to the, to the uh, realization of indigenous land rights. Okay. So for example, um, in the study, what I, I did, I show you, I tried to, to explain we have different land use systems and we, we shift from one place to another. That kind of provides uh, the understanding of the mechanism of land use, right? And remember what I mentioned in uh, my last talk. We, we, we are not trying to claim a whole territory as with one kind of land rights, right? We, what we, we, want, we, we are trying to do is identify the different land use in the ter traditional territory, then you can try to uh, ask or require for different land rights, for, for example, the usage right, right? Some, some place or the, some, the, the, the location for you to, you know, collect things, uh, to collect things. You don't have to have ownership of that, right? If you are requiring ownership of whole indigenous traditional territory, kind of, frighten people, right? Also, no, no necessary. So what we have to do is to, you know, understand our own way of land use and try to interpret, make interpretation to the contemporary or modern land rights system. But this kind of methodology has, hasn't been established uh, when the uh, mapping project began. So, uh, that's the reason the government questioned the outcome of the project launched by itself. Okay. Uh, but I also see something positive. Like after 2012, since there are more and more diverse uh, self-organized research. If I can, I will show you some examples. Um, Okay, so that's what we did in past few years. I and my students, we went to different um, uh, community and organized different workshops. So this is one of the examples my student did. Uh, she did his uh, research in Bunon community. So uh, in this region, that uh, there are different clan and household scattered uh, in the watershed. And later they were uh, relocated 
to this uh, Lavulan community. But the people who live in Lavulan community nowadays, they actually come from different uh, clan system, uh, from different origin. So if the government try to find, uh, identify the traditional ter territory of Lavulan community, then it will fail. Because these people come from different origins. And in contrast to that, the Daki Hosoan uh, family, they, they, they were divided to two different communities, Lavulan community and Waasi community. So their descendants in these two communities, according to uh, Bunun people's customary law, they have the right the, over the same piece of traditional territory. So in this research, this student tried to say, you cannot just look into the community we have now, because people have been moving around. What you have to do in the Bunun uh, uh, um, case, you have to trace their migration and their clan system. And this was uh, another one of my students uh, did. She is from Taiwan community. And what he did uh, is uh, the, trying to explain the, um, the, the genealogy system in Taiwan people. So in, in uh, Jinalian means settlement in Taiwan language. In one Jinalian, they will have a core family, the chief family. And the elder of the chief family will succeed. Uh, the, the house. And the second son or second uh, uh, daughter will go move out and build their own um, their own um, house. So that's, if you trust the house name, then you can find their genealogy. And in their system, if you are the descendant of the core family, you succeed the name of the family. And your father come from a settlement A and your mother come from settlement B, then you have the right over both of the settlements. And then you marry with the uh, people from settlement C, then your children have the right over A, B, C. Then marry to another uh, settlement, so the descendant will have the right of A, B, C, D. Okay, so that's a strategy for Taiwan people to <laughs> extend their territory build connection. Then, if you want to trace Taiwan people's commun uh, traditional territory, you, you sh cannot just look into the administrative boundary nowadays. You have to look into their genealogy. Okay, so that's another example that this kind of self-organized research uh, accompanied with uh, the community particip participation that give more uh, deeper interpretation of the knowledge of uh, traditional territory. And uh, I think uh, that will kind of help us to um, um, foster a better way to uh, realize our right, our traditional territory right in the future. Oh, great. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Um, I think it's really nice there are some evidence and collaboration. Uh, that's, my, that's where I draw my question. When, as we can see from some of the example, beautiful collaboration and result can happen. What is the biggest obstacle from your observation to stop that, um, um, allow that, um, like transferable skill or knowledge to become a dialogue to occur when it comes to policy making mm -hmm. in these areas. Is it a political problem or institutional problem? Is that the way the local government and organization is designed or is uh, it is a numbers game because um, as we see the, the indigenous people population is going down. I'm curious what is that? Second question is, um, what is the young people's, uh, the indigenous uh, young people today, or how they see themselves, uh, or do they have a chance to participate in a project like that, or is it very much of a, 
for example, in university level um, or under your research, young people have uh, what is the what is the indigenous people thought? Uh, young people today, how do they participate it and uh, and how do they make a progressive uh, contribution to collaboration like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that's very really good, important, good and, and important question. I will start with answering the second one. Uh, I, I I see a lot of young people in, uh, uh, involved in the mapping process. Mm -hmm. I was kind of surprised, right? Because when I say one third or half of uh, indigenous people are now living in the urban area. These young people, they're kind of disconnected from the indigenous community, right? So I found that mapping turned into a way for them to connect themselves back to the community, right? It, um, it's a way for you, it's a, uh, for you, or it's a tool or, or a platform for you to start your, you know, community uh, dialogue with the community elder, when you try to uh, do some in-depth interview, or you try to go uh, uh, trail hiking, you have to talk to the elders, and, and you can identify or learn the, the, the knowledge of the landscape through the map. So you can very quickly get uh, the image of what your, your hometown or your traditional territory is. So I found it's very interesting, this kind of map. It's not the real world, right? But it's kind of formed a connection between those young men. First, the image, the, 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 the map provides a concrete image of the landform of their hometown. So that makes them very quickly have this kind of connection. Second, it's a way uh, for you to start to build your connection. So I see many cases that, uh, of course, not every indigenous young man will, is doing this. But I, I see more than, I would say, 10 groups mm -hmm. at this moment are doing this kind of community mapping work. Uh, and most, many of them are, are, are young men. Because you, you gave us an example of the uh, organic farming. Yeah. Uh, is that... Um, um, Taipei youngsters coming back to the village, or is that something? Uh, uh, there must be a link there with younger people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the organic farming, yes, uh, there are farmers who has been doing their farming work there for a lifetime, but also some young farmers. I have one student. He did his PhD in my. University. He is also a farmer at the same time. And it's impossible uh, before for him to do this, right? But nowadays, if he has class, he can drive from uh, his uh, settlement to, to Taipei, to Zhengda, for like three hours. Okay. Then, uh, uh, um, um, had, uh, participate in the, in the class another three hours to go back. Oh. It's kind of difficult, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's much more convenient than before, right? Mm -hmm. So that make it possible to go between the commu uh, community and the urban area. Mm -hmm. So that's a new um, spatial relations between the indigenous community and the urban area. It's not so distant. Taiwan is not very big. Right? When, when you say one third or, or half of people living in an urban area, does not mean that they don't go back anymore? Mm -hmm. I live in an urban area, right? But I go back to my village like once or twice a month, and even more often uh, before. So I have some connection there. So, um, yes, uh, the, 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 there are something good and something bad. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. First question. Oh, did, did, was that your first question, not fully answered? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I kind of forget the Let's first go to the back. <laughs> what is the biggest obstacle? Oh, the obstacle. Yeah, the obstacles, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, 
for um, it depends on what's the purpose for mapping, right? So if you are mapping for uh, identify your traditional territory and try to uh, go through this process to 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 uh, claim uh, your right over your traditional territory, then I think yes, uh, the 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 institutional or the government uh, is one of big uh, obstacles because the logic they have um, it's kind of you know trying to make your make your knowledge fit into your the, their their framework right so very often um, it will kind of undermine the way indigenous knowledge is. Okay, so we're, we're running out of time, but let's just take let's take two questions together. Um, okay, so you go first. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful speech and introduction. Personally, I gained a lot of knowledge uh, from this. My question is about the uh, um, policy background uh, that you have uh, showed to us on the uh, presentation. It's about the after the year 2012, um, the legal recognition of rights of indigenous people still uh, is kind of lack of implementation. Uh, I want to ask what kind of law or um, regulation um, that you refer to from this. Is it um, customary law of indigenous people or um, land law? I'm sorry, can you repeat? Um, the uh, um, implementation of law that you referred to from the uh, presentation mm -hmm. um, is after the year 2012. Is um, the from new party. Oh, new partnership. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, the survey based on the survey. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and the, the, uh, the second oh, question. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question about, I mean, I found very interesting your story about how uh, following the typhoon of 2004, uh, you, they used little trees uh, mm -hmm. to prevent landslide. Yeah. And since then, like, uh, does the government partner a little bit more when it comes to like resolving environmental issues with indigenous community? Because they seem to have knowledge, like different knowledge from like alternative to food to technology. And I think that just, yeah, we need to know about that. If the, is there more collaboration today between the communities and the government mm -hmm. when it comes to environmental mm -hmm. policy? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I, I, I was um, asked by an uh, officer of uh, Forest Bureau uh, to introduce him to the community mem member, and he wanted to know more about the way people you know, recover the landslide. So, yes, it, it's progressing uh, slowly. But it's very much uh, due to the attitude of individual officers, because uh, there is, um, for for I think for for a government officer, you just follow the track mm -hmm. you already have. That's easy, most easy way, easier way, way right? Mm -hmm. So they, most most of them don't want to change. But if, if someone wants to change, then then. Uh, that will happen. So yes, uh, it's uh, it's changing slowly. Another example we have uh, is a hunting issue. That uh, two uh, ten ten years ago, uh, the 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 government um, had an exper experimental project, the Forest Bureau again in the central part of Taiwan that uh, allowed indigenous people to go hunt in the forest, which was uh, prohibited previously. So it's kind of progress, right? Relatively progress. But the Forest Bureau required indigenous people, Bunun people, to register before they go hunt. What animal, what species, and how many you want to hunt. It's kind of, yeah, you are laughing, right? But. Um, for, it's kind of confused uh, the Bunun people because for Bunun's tradition, you don't do this. 
you don't say what, what you want to hunt and how many you want. If you say so, then you will get nothing. Right. Uh, well, no people, luck. yeah, yeah, that will bring bad luck. It's okay. violating the, 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 the taboo, violating the taboo. Very similar, like my people, uh, Dayan people, when the elder, the hunter, want to go hunt in the forest, they will not say, I'm going to go hunting. They will say, oh, I'm going to look around. <laughs> they, so they're very humble, you know, low, low, low profile. Right. right. <laughs> Again, yeah. But the Forest Bureau required in, uh, Bunun people to register what they want, how many animals they will hunt. So, so they cause the com confusion, right? Mm -hmm. But it, when, when Bunun people go hunt in the forest, doesn't mean they, they just hunt irregularly. They have their logic, right? Even though they, they don't predict what animal or how, how many they want to hunt, there are certain places they don't go to, right? There are certain certain rule over different location or different um, like th they they have different clan sy system. So the hunting field belong to different clan system, managed by different clan system. So even those they don't regulate, they, they don't control the species and the the, the, the the number, but they do control the landscape. By managing the landscape, they can also maintain the ecological uh, sustainability. Right, that's the two different logic behind in the, between indigenous uh, hunting and uh, uh, the management of forest bureau. In less ten years, we try to convince the, the forest bureau, and they accept that. So now they have a new experimental project. They 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 let indigenous people to go hunt with with our unknown. Uh, at the same time, they require indigenous people, indigenous people to report after after hunting. And they also uh, hire some scientists, ecologists, to do some monitoring work. Like, they put the camera, and they, they, they record the, the number of camera. And if indigenous people are, are practicing their um, norm of hunting, and also the number of animals doesn't decrease, that means the, the norm work. In next step, the, the Forest Bureau will sign some contract with the, the, the community so that they can uh, authorize the community to, 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 to manage the forest. Mm -hmm. And actually, so people in Ali San is now designed the contract with the, uh, that they are going to sign with the Forest Bureau. So I will say, yes, in Taiwan, something is happening. It's not in large, large scale, but... Mm -hmm. um, some effort, after some effort, we are doing some uh, minor scale ex experimental work. Yeah. Did you have any response to the, the legal question? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, oh yeah, yeah, it's the, um, in 2002, yeah. it's the new partnership uh, um, um, treaty. It's, it's not really a legal construction, okay. it's more like a political statement. But it's kind of formed the, the principle of the, the, the policy back to that time. So under that policy, the administrative, uh, uh, the government, the CIP, Council of Asian People, have to, you know, do, to begin the, the, the mapping work. And it's 2002. And only until 2005, indigenous best law uh, is passed, in, enacted in the Congress. That gives more detail about what kind of right indigenous people should have. So they begin the mapping work earlier. That makes some outcome of the, 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 the mapping uh, is not so directly usable for, for the legal um, construction or for the realization of land rights. But we learned that if we can have more self-organized self uh, mapping work, that can give more uh, 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 subjective, subjectivity for the community member to make our um, self-interpretation. That will be deeper than what we see in the outcome of the government lead uh, uh, mapping project. And that can really help for us to rethink what, what's the, the mechanism of land use and how do we use the, this knowledge to uh, incorporate this knowledge to the construction of the resource management regime. Uh, thank Daya.
for two remarkable uh, talks. Thank you. Thank you.